What makes writing good or bad? When we critique a show for being poorly written or praise it for its excellent writing, what exactly do we mean? Is calling out bad writing just us disagreeing with the show's message, getting annoyed by a character, or being disappointed that we didn't see the ending we want? Is our praise for good writing simply a statement that we identify with the characters? That's certainly not what we should mean by our approval or disapproval of a story's writing. We should evaluate writing on its own merits, determining whether it is good or bad regardless of what we think of the show's message, morals, or whether it should have been made at all. For example, as a huge Tolkien fan, I was not pleased by the changes to his world made by the showrunners of Rings of Power, as evidenced by the trailer. However, just because I then lost interest in the show and didn't bother watching it doesn't mean that I couldn't find the show well written if I actually got around to watching it. By all accounts, from what I've heard, it is not well written, but it could have been, even if it bastardized Tolkien's world. Similarly, even though I strongly disagree with the decision to make Obi-Wan start out as this dejected, hopeless has-been in his own show, the writing still could have been good. How? Well, I've come up with a list of four aspects of writing that I use to judge whether characters' dialogue and decisions and actions are deemed well or poorly written. All of these elements need to be balanced. If they go too far to one side or the other, they make for bad writing. On one end of the subtlety spectrum, we have exposition, dialogue written for the audience's benefit, sentences that aren't spoken because the character needs to say them or another character needs to hear them, but because their writers think the audience needs to know this particular thing right now. For example, You are reckless. You will forget this fixation with Kenobi. There's no build-up to this moment of revelation about Reva. We've barely met her, and yet we apparently need to know that she wants Obi-Wan and isn't satisfied hunting lesser Jedi. Though she appeared to be quite eager to find and kill this one, but we'll get to that later. The Grand Inquisitor simply served as a mouthpiece for the writers here, telling the audience about Reva by telling Reva things about Reva. It's unnatural and forced, and it makes it seem as if the writers have no faith in our ability to think about these characters and their motivations. We need to know right away the writers think, what all these characters are about, and the quickest way to convey such details to your audience is to have a character simply tell it to the audience. On the other end of the nuance subtlety spectrum would be dialogue that is too vague. This often occurs when writers are trying too hard to not exposit, but they do it clumsily, having characters spout dialogue that comes off as nonsense because they're not natural statements, but rather are haphazard attempts to exposit without being obvious about it. Take, for example, the Grand Inquisitor telling Riva, You are the least of us. Why? Well, apparently because... You came to us from the gutter. This is clumsy and vague. It portrays the idea that the other Inquisitors dislike Riva, though her status as third sister clearly indicates she is not the least of them, but the reasons given are unspecific to the point of being meaningless. In the middle, we have dialogue that feels natural, conversations that flow in a familiar manner. Take, for example, the conversation between Deputy Inspector Cyril Karn and the Chief Inspector in Andor's pilot episode. The chief inspector tells Cyril about how he wants him to find a way to classify the murder of the two security guards as an accident. But they were murdered. No, they were killed in a fight. As it's important to keep official crime rates down. This implies a great deal, but states very little of it outright. The chief inspector does exposit a bit about his job. We're obviously asked to make a report about our crime rates, and the goal of that speech is brevity. But in doing so hints at a good many other things, like how serious, or not serious rather, this organization is when it comes to actually providing security and Cyril's reactions to the Chief Inspector's orders tells us what he thinks of that revelation. We don't need to have it all spelled out for us. The information is readily available if we read just a tiny bit between the lines and pay attention to body language and facial expressions. It's not complicated for the audience to figure out. It's quite instinctive, really. But the trick is writing dialogue and characters that convey these ideas in a natural way. Let's revisit that moment that I mentioned earlier, where Riva was eager to find and kill Nari, and then five seconds later she gives up on chasing him because he dropped an awning in her way. And she proceeds to complain. What she's after scraps. Scraps are all we have left. That is wildly inconsistent. Her words do not match her actions, and her actions don't even match her actions. Why try to kill him and then give up so easily? Why be so bloodthirsty when random Jedi like this apparently aren't even worth your time? Sick of wasting time. But enough about Riva, let's move on to Leia. You think the less you say, the less you give away. But really, it's the opposite. Make me float. 
What? I want to float. Do you see the problem? At one moment, she's supposedly wise beyond her years, speaking with piercing insight, and the next, she's asking Obi-Wan to make her float. If she's so smart, she should be aware of the danger of the situation and realize that drawing attention to themselves is a terrible idea. But she's written inconsistently and by someone who has no idea how children speak, so this is what we get. One more example of the writing not matching the character. This is where he told us to come to. Maybe they're just late? Maybe it was a lie. I knew it. I never should have trusted him. Maybe. No one is coming here, Leia. Does the Obi-Wan we've known for four movies and seven seasons of a show seem like the kind of guy who would panic at the first sign of things that aren't exactly on schedule? No. No, of course he doesn't. This is far from the biggest inconsistency with Obi-Wan's character. His overall temperament in the show is at odds with his portrayal in the rest of canon. But I note this moment in particular because it's out of character for Obi-Wan as this very show has written him. In episode two, they show him effectively and efficiently finding Leia, taking out several would-be ambushers in the process. This show has shown Obi-Wan to be cool under pressure, and yet in this moment, he loses his mind over a slight scheduling error. It's horrifically inconsistent. On the other end of the consistency spectrum, we have characters who act exactly in line with their personality every step of the way to the point of being one-dimensional. People are by nature complex and conflicted, so some differences in behavior are expected and tolerated. But we do not only have a single emotion or way of acting. So where do we start with one-dimensional characters in the Obi-Wan show? You've got Tala, who is calm, confident, and capable. She handles every problem she is faced with without so much as changing her facial expression. You've got the fifth brother, whose only purpose in the show is to be angry about Riva's ambition. They make for boring, predictable characters who don't display any of the depth that is found in literally every living being. They don't react to the world around them in any meaningful way. They don't change or grow because they have a single dimension that the writers fail to make them stray from. Characters need to develop. The events that happen in their world should change them. Take Gollum, for example. At the beginning of the prison arc, he is a head down, just get through this type of guy. If he had maintained that attitude throughout the arc, never straying from his mission of just staying alive until his sentence was up, then he absolutely could have been classified as one-dimensional. But he did change. The revelation of the fact that no one gets out, they just get moved around, which is built up to gradually and gracefully, by the way, serves as the tipping point for him. Seeing that the goal toward which he had striven for, had survived for, was out of reach was a complete lie. He diverted the fervor he'd been pouring into his previous mission into his new purpose, escape. Or let's take a look at Luthen, the mastermind in a way behind so much of the fledgling rebellion. When we first see Cassian meet him in episode three, we realize he is more than we thought. He is not just an arms dealer, he is a rebel. We would expect someone in his position to be an idealist, someone who truly believes in the rebel's cause, who sees through the lies of the empire and into its rotten core. And he is those things. He is an idealist, but he is also a pragmatist to a severe moral fault. He is willing to sacrifice a valuable rebel leader and his crew in order to maintain the confidentiality of his spy. Luthen clearly believes that the end justify the means, an idea that you wouldn't expect many rebel leaders to hold, since if you're willing to do anything for your cause, willing to let men die when you could easily save them, can you really call yourself better than the Empire? No. No, you can't. But the beauty of it is that Luthen acknowledges that. I'm condemned to use the tools of my enemy to defeat them. The raw emotion in Luthen's speech here after Lonnie asks him, And what do you sacrifice? is incredibly powerful. This is one of the absolute best moments of Andor, hands down. Not only do we get to see the ugly side of the rebellion, the cost, both mental and physical, of resisting the Empire, but we get a glimpse inside the tortured mind of a man who believes he is sacrificing his very soul for the rebellion's cause. For which there's only one conclusion. I'm damned for what I do. I can't think off the top of my head of another moment in cinema like this, where a character admits that his actions are immoral and reprehensible, but he does them anyway at his own personal cost because he believes it will make a brighter future. If you think of an example like this, please let me know. I'd love to watch it. This monologue of Luthen's is so powerful because the show has been building up to it. So what do I sacrifice? Everything! We've seen him recruit Cassian, no matter how the other rebels will react. We've watched him keep secrets from and lie to Mon Mothma. We've shuddered in horror as he reveals to Saw that he intends to let Krieger walk into a trap. We know the things he has done, the things he is capable of, 
and now we get to hear how he views himself. It's an incredibly poignant scene. The toll taken upon Luthen's psyche by these immoral, damnable acts is put on full display. It makes the audience pause, makes us want to watch it again, to ponder how a person, an idealist who believes in fair treatment, justice, and democracy, can will himself to commit such horrific transgressions. You may have felt sorry for Luthen here, or maybe you felt angry at him for knowingly acting so heinously, or maybe you were just stunned by his frank about his own condemnation, or maybe you felt all three of those emotions and more. Regardless, you can't have watched this scene and not felt something. This is good, emotionally powerful writing, writing that succeeds in evoking emotion by building to a reveal, a monologue, conversation that has impact on the audience. So, Having an impact on the audience is good in the middle of the sliding scale. What are on the opposite ends? Well, I would suggest that on one end, we have writing that does not impact the audience because it simply doesn't care. It puts in no effort to affect the audience in any way. Let's use the example of part four of Obi-Wan Kenobi, in which Obi-Wan finds out, hey, he can be a Jedi again. This moment, and this moment, are only a few minutes apart. Obi-Wan goes from struggling to use the Force at all to back to his full Jedi Master self in an incredibly short time. Why? Well, he receives an impassioned, inspiring pep talk from Tala. You care about Leia, then you're gonna have to try. You might think this was uninspired, flat, and boring, and you would absolutely be right. Obi-Wan's journey back from despairing survivor to hopeful warrior has absolutely no emotional depth or weight. It just happens, and the audience has no choice other than to go, oh, oh, okay, that was quick. So what's on the other end of the scale? Those would be moments that may in fact affect the audience, but are so blatantly meant to do so that they're uninspiring and trite. Reva's redemption at the end, for example. We're supposed to feel sympathy for her, to acknowledge her suffering, but really most of us were just thinking, hey, uh, maybe don't kill the kid. Unlike Luthen's speech, this moment was not sufficiently built up to and earned. It just kind of happens. Reva shows up at Owen and Beru's farm, fully intent on murdering Luke, having done zero self-reflection and having shown zero hesitation or weakness prior to this. And then in one moment, she's just like, oh yeah, that this would make me like Vader and that's no good. And then she sobs about not being able to follow through with her heinous plan, which uh, if you feel sympathy for Reva here, maybe rethink how you view characters. All right, I've bashed the Kenobi show a lot. So let's take a moment and visit a bit of writing that actually earned some emotional weight. Anakin. This scene works on some level. This dialogue actually leaves an impression on the audience because these two characters have an established history, an emotional bond that is hard, if not impossible, to truly destroy. Vader's words, I am not your failure. Obi-Wan are also written with some nuance. They tell us how his pride has overtaken him, how he wants to believe that Obi-Wan has no power over, no responsibility for him, for who he's become. Although it does contradict what Vader said in part three of the show. I am what you made me. So no points for consistency there. Anyway, we see and feel Obi-Wan come to grips with that, with the fact that my friend is truly dead. Sure, this dialogue is basically handed to the writers of this show by the writers of A New Hope, but they executed it pretty well. Ewan McGregor's performance is also great. He makes us feel for him in this moment in a way that no other character in the show really does. It's not to say that this scene is perfect or even very good. As I've noted in a previous video, Obi-Wan's statement that my friend is truly dead is inconsistent with his decision to leave Vader alive, especially since he had earlier stated whether he dies or I do, this ends today. And the writers couldn't resist having Vader spout some generic villain dialogue. The same way, I will destroy you. Which does nothing to advance the plot, the scene, or the characters. Trite lines like this have no... Dialogue and actions should have meaning and purpose. Everything a character says and does should be said and done for a reason. Whether it's establishing their own character, developing another character, progressing the plot, building the world, adding or relieving tension, everything should have a purpose. What does this accomplish should be the foremost question to answer when writing a piece of a story. Narrative weight is a tricky thing because we can't just have every single word spoken and every single act done by a character directly affect the main plot. That would be at the extreme end of the sliding scale. 
dialogue, and actions that are entirely in service of driving the story forward. This would result in a plot that feels unnatural, hurried, and forced, with characters that largely serve as mouthpieces for exposition dumps. This is how we end up with contrivances, lines of dialogue, and plot points that have flawed logic, if any logic at all, behind them and are present in the story merely to shove the plot forward in the writer's desired direction. For example, in the last episode of Kenobi, Vader has the entire Star Destroyer turn to chase after Obi-Wan's little shuttle, despite the fact that Vader could have just taken his own ship and let the Star Destroyer deal with the fleeing not-yet-rebels. His decision makes absolutely no sense, but it is necessary for the two plot points the writers wanted, the not-yet-rebels getting away and Obi-Wan and Darth Vader facing off in a duel. Writing that is only focused on the destination, on where the story will end up, often makes the journey forced and contrived, pushing along the plot without regard for consistency or logic. On the other end of the narrative weight spectrum, we get fluff. Words and actions that have little to no bearing on the story overall, that do not establish the world or the characters. I pointed out two examples of how Kenobi's action scenes fall squarely into the fluff category in my previous video on these two shows. But to nobody's surprise, a good bit of the dialogue also falls into this category. Sentences spoken for the sake of filling the air, fearing that if the audience doesn't hear the characters saying words at every possible moment, they'll get bored and go read a book or something. For example, after Obi-Wan asks to speak with Riva, he then says this. She started this when she kidnapped Leia. That line had no reason to exist. Was Obi-Wan trying to fill in those around him on the backstory of his history with Riva? He just throws this sentence out there like it means something. But everyone who cares already knows that Riva kidnapped Leia, and it's not like him revealing this would change anything. So why does this line exist? That may seem like nitpicking, and maybe it is. Nitpicking is a largely personal definition, but I maintain that every line of dialogue should have some sort of purpose, and I can't think of a single reason for this one. Another example of vocal fluff comes from part three of the Kenobi show, where Vader is about to start an Obi-Wan barbecue. Now you will suffer. Yeah. We get it. You got burned, and now you're burning Obi-Wan. We understand the visual symbolism without Vader having to say anything here. Vader is at his most intimidating when he doesn't say a word, when he just does what needs to be done. Think about how much less you'd like this scene from Rogue One if Vader was talking trash to the rebels while he mowed through them. Vader is a man of no more words than is necessary, except not in this case because the writers couldn't resist having him spout some more generic villain dialogue. Your pain has just begun. So what does writing with proper narrative weight look like? There are a plethora of examples from any well-written show, and Andor is one such show, so I'll pick one pretty much just at random. Let's go with part nine of the show, in which Bix is being interrogated as to her knowledge of Cassian, Luthan, and their whereabouts. I say interrogated, but really she's being tortured. The kindly Imperial torturer describes the method of the torture. There was a species which the Empire wiped out that makes an poodle agonized pleading when they die, which caused those who heard it to have a severe, negative, and lasting emotional reaction. The Empire, being the Empire, decided we can use this, and extracted the sounds and made some alterations to suit their purpose. And we found a section of what we believe are primarily children. This monologue by the Imperial Torturer does flirt with exposition at times, but since there's no other way we could really have learned this information, it doesn't really stick out too much and we let it slide. What it does accomplish nicely is displaying the absolute depravity of the Galactic Empire. Why? To what purpose? Well, we know that the Imperials are the baddies, that they'll use any means necessary to achieve their goals. Well, Bix doesn't know that. Bix isn't really familiar with the Empire, and the audience doesn't know how Bix's story will play out. Will this be a turning point for her as she converts from thief to rebel, or will it have some other unforeseen effect? We don't know, but we can guess, and thus we are invested. A more subtle example comes at the end of the prison break scene, when Cassian says, why does this line carry narrative weight? Because it gives us insight into Andor's thoughts, his inner narrative, his personal journey. This line tells us that he did not merely escape because he quite naturally wanted to get out of prison. He did it as an act of rebellion to prove that the Empire can be beaten. After the Aldani arc, he gets his credits and he gets out like he'd planned. He remained a mercenary whose dominating interest was his own well-being. His arrest, imprisonment, and witness of the Imperial methods changed that. Where others were content to keep their heads down, Cassian found it within himself to break the mold, to inspire change, to lead, to rebel. He successfully led these men into rebellion. Regardless of whether they live or die, they proved, even if to no one but themselves, that they can fight and they can win. 
Cassian realizes this. He acknowledges that this very act of rebellion was a victory. Where Obi-Wan Kenobi's writing shifts violently from fluff to exposition with characters that contradict their personalities on a regular basis, Andor's writing maintains a consistent quality of nuance and weightiness that lets the show move along at a natural, unhurried, yet satisfying pace with characters and storylines that are given time to breathe and allow the audience to get invested. You could spend many, many more hours analyzing these two shows and picking out the good and the bad in both of them. I acknowledge Andor is not a perfect product and Obi-Wan Kenobi is not complete trash, but the examples I've illustrated here demonstrate clearly how one show's writers dedicated time and effort into developing the character arcs and plot, where the other's creators were happy to simply churn out a product. And that will do it for part two of Obi-Wan Kenobi vs. Andor. Let me know what aspects of the show you'd like me to see compare in part three. Go watch part one if you haven't already. Tell me all your thoughts in the comments and thank you for watching.